All right, everyone. So we're going to break down the trades for today, finishing the week on Friday with a green day. That was very important after two consecutive red days. Biggest red day of the year on Wednesday with my biggest loss of the year on Wednesday, a $10,000 loss, which grand scheme of things is not bad, but still it is the biggest of the year. Uh, yesterday, I finished down about 1700 That was not great either. And today, I started with $400 loser. And I was like, man, I said out loud, I was like, it would be really nice not to start the day with a loser. Because starting the day with a loser, it feels like I'm just, I'm off to a bad start. It's like tripping right out of the starting gates. And it's like, man, I would really like to start over. But this has just kind of been the way it's been. Now, fortunately, the first trade, only a $500 loss manageable, not anywhere close to my max loss, a trade that I got in, got stopped out on, and of course not a live stop because it was pre-market, but bailed out on it. And, and that's okay. It's fine. It's just that there weren't a lot more opportunities to recoup that loss. Now I did end up recouping it, but you know, what was interesting today was that we had these SPACs, these special acquisition companies that basically gapped up 200, 300, 400, 500% on like a thousand shares of volume, two thousand shares of volume, and then just sold off all morning. Now a couple of them put in a little bounce off the low, maybe short covering, but honestly, I, I'm, I'm it's hard for me to kind of understand exactly how a stock gaps up four hundred percent on only two thousand shares with no news, and I feel like this is hinting at something with high frequency trading algorithms or something with certain institutional players out there that there's some motivation to push these up and then we see the the fade back down and it's like it's creates liquidity that allows selling right so i don't know if they're trying to game algos or what's going on but it was a little shady and i'll show you um a couple of examples of that here for today so let's see um so the first one this morning we'll look at smap smap this stock i mean this it's a recent special acquisition company and this stock goes all the way up pre-market to $52, $52 a share. But the thing is, it opened. If we look at this, basically yesterday, it was at $8. And then there were 422 shares of volume at 15. And then all of a sudden, there's 5,000 shares of volume at 39 and then another 6,000 shares of volume at $50 a share. And then it hits 52 and starts selling. So basically, what's the total volume on this today? The total volume on it today, as of right now, is um, it's 176,000 shares. And so, you know, basically, the majority of the volume has been selling, selling, selling. It's just been the steady selling all the way back to 10. Let's look at another one. Let's look at um, ATAK. And this is the one that I ended up trading on the dead cat bounce, but um, ATAK, this one gaps up. Th this one literally gapped on 2,038 shares of volume. It gapped from yesterday $10 to a high of $90 a share on 2,000 shares. So that doesn't, you know, obviously that's almost like a, a error in, in the market, like an anomaly. I mean, it's, it's one thing for a stock to squeeze up 100, 200% on news and it's moving higher, even if it's on light volume, it's, there's news. But for a stock just to, to be at $8 and then the next day to open at 90. So, you know what this made me think of, um, there's a book on um, high frequency trading algorithms that I read um, a couple years ago that is interesting. It's called Dark Pools. And I might have it in my, uh, no, I think I, I might have it up on the shelf over there. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, you could check it out if you want. It, it's on Amazon, or you could probably get it on uh, audiobook. But anyways, um, they were talking about how 
in the early days of electronic trading, um, before electronic trading, brokers were on the floor, right? They're trading on the floor and the market makers at NASDAQ and the specialists on the New York Stock Exchange, they're making the market. So they're standing at their little booth or whatever, and they're they're holding basically an offer to buy stock and to sell stock, and they're creating the spread and they profit from the spread. So they just sit there and all day long, you know, people are buying and they're 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 actually managing the market. They're punching tickets and then those tickets get entered manually and that creates the tape. So it was like all a manual system. And then late 80s, I think it was maybe very early 90s, they switched to require, see, because this is the thing, when all of a sudden there was a drop, the market makers were like, oh, we don't want to make the market anymore. They would step back and that would all of a sudden create these flash panic crashes, even in regular market. So then they said, we need to have some form of uh, digital electronic trading. So all the market makers are required to post a bid and an offer in the electronic system and up to 100 shares, they have to honor it. So now let me get out my whiteboard here for a second. This is kind of funny. All right, so um, let's see. Oh, my whiteboard's a little screwed up. I'm going to push back this uh, camera. That'll be that'll be good enough. All right. Uh, so so what would happen is, you know, let's just say a stock like um, ATAK. ATAK. So the market maker is posting a bid, um, you know, at let's say $8, whatever it was yesterday, of 100 shares. And then they're on the ask, the offer at 850 for another 100 shares. All right. So what would happen is the, spe the, the market makers put in these orders and they were in the system and they had to be honored. So the next morning, if the stock was gapping up to $16 a share because there was great news, it's up 100%. Well, these orders were still in the system at a hundred at a hundred shares at eight dollars. And so what people would literally do is they would buy the hundred shares right here on the offer from this market maker, market maker number one. This guy's a real dummy. He forgot to update his orders. So traders would buy from this stale order, but he has to honor it up to a hundred shares. So they buy hundred shares from him here. And then, of course, there's market makers that have actually updated their prices and they're at $16 a share, 16, you know, 20. And then they would turn around and then they would sell it to this market maker right here, profiting a, well, in this case, eight point return. So boom, that's 800 bucks, 800 bucks. And then what they would do is they would go and do it again. They'd buy and then they'd sell and then they'd buy and then they'd sell and then they'd buy and then they'd sell. And there's a story of um, someone doing that and making like $125,000 or something because the market maker was kind of sleeping on their order. And the market maker was so upset. He walked across, this was like, I think it was in New York City. He walked across um, the street. He was so angry and he actually stabbed the guy with, a, I think it was a like a letter opener or a pen or something. He didn't kill him, but he was really, really mad. So um, anyways, this what this makes me think is um you know we've got this um we've, we've got, we have i feel like something similar happening and i'm not sure you know how it all the pieces work together but you know let's just obviously recognize that we had atak special acquisition company yesterday trading at let's see what what was the close yesterday's close was um it was actually ten dollars and 51 cents so 1051, that was the close, 1051. And then this morning, all of a sudden, it, it's $90 a share. $90 a share. Now, you know, obviously there weren't any like you this didn't trigger a short squeeze, although someone who could have been short this stock at 10 would have been uh facing an 800 percent they they'd be down a tremendous amount you know, a thousand shares, they'd be down 80 grand, but it didn't trigger buy orders to go through. Remember, of course, stop orders uh, don't work pre-market. They only work during regular trading hours. But of course, a margin call could happen pre-market and a broker could start executing on that margin call. 
Um, but but we didn't see that because if we did, we would have all of a sudden seen a lot of buying come through and it would have squeezed up to 90, 100, 120, 150. So we didn't see it, a short get squeezed. Um, longs, it almost seems, got the biggest benefit because those who were in before, now the stock's at 90 and pretty much all morning, they're just selling, 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 selling. So, you know, you have to think like who's benefiting from this? And it seems like the longs are the ones that were benefiting from it. So then it's like, okay, um, you know, but once again, how did the stock go from there to there on 2,038 shares of volume? Market makers not making the market? Um, I, I don't know. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to it, but obviously this is the thing where we saw it today on ATAK. We saw it on S, um, SMAP, which I already showed you. We saw it on um, BRLI. So this one went to 50. BRLI, this one didn't go up as much. This one went up to um, 16, but yesterday it was at $6. Then we had uh, BYTS. BYTS, this one, let's see. Um, so it was like, and this is the thing, it wasn't just one stock, it was like, all the SPACs. This one went to $26. Then there was Clay, C-L-A-Y. This one hit a high of 32. There was J-A-Q-C. So all of these were special acquisition companies. Uh, it's it's weird. And you know, to how, what could you have really done with this? I mean, I guess for us as retail traders, you you could have considered shorting, but the fact is the spreads on these were terrible. The liquidity was really poor. And God forbid, all of a sudden, a, a short from earlier did start to get forced to cover. You know, their, their clearing firm or their broker just starts pressing the buy button. Uh, you know, holy smokes, that could have been really, really bad. Um, that could be an, an epic squeeze on something like this. So, you know, I don't know that it would have been super safe to to be short in a big way, but um, it's just weird. And it feels like kind of, I don't know, just like something in this sort of system is a little bit broken. Now, the other day I was talking about how there's this sort of misperception, this perception that um, these market makers and high frequency trading algorithms create liquidity. And they do, but only when the market is very... Um, range bound because when the markets are volatile then all of a sudden a lot of these algorithms will just turn off you know a, a, a stock will trade outside the standard deviation and automatically it just backs out it's it's turns off it's gone that high frequent that particular algorithm it it knows when it performs the best just like me as a trader i know when i perform the best and i know the type of stocks i perform the best so there's a lot that i might trade and then at a certain point i'm like no i can't trade it anymore and these algorithms are no different but what we know and what we've heard is that they make the most in tighter ranges when they can just be churning shares back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And when you get these really big extensions up and down, there's less, there, there's more, a lot more risk. And so that reduces the, the ROI. And so the, they'll just back out. And then you have these areas where it's kind of wild because you'll have a stock, for instance, that is, you know, it could be trading, uh, it, it goes up and then it's kind of in this range. And in this range here, you know, the volume bars, it's kind of like light volume and then it comes up and then the volume just sort of stays constant here. It's like you just have a lot of volume. And then when it starts to pull away here, what often happens, you get more volume initially on the pop and then the volume starts to go down lower and lower and lower and lower and lower as this is going parabolic. We've seen that. And I, I think that speaks to the fact that a lot of this volume in this area is generated by these high frequency trading algorithms, you know, and institutions and whatever market makers and things like that. So on the one hand, when stocks are breaking out of the range is when things get interesting. That's when we get the bigger moves. And, and maybe part of it is because they pull back their orders. Uh, but on the other hand, when you have something like this, it's like, it's almost the most extreme level where it, it becomes untradeable. So I would sort of say there's a little bit of a bell curve here of tradability of these stocks. 
And like this, you know, is sort of the SPACs today, which I don't even know what to think. This is also sometimes, um, we've had a couple times where there's been um, broker errors with reverse splits, where the reverse split isn't calculated correctly and then it gets all wonky. There's been um, Q SIP uh, errors where the ID for a stock, it gets mixed. So you're ordering on one stock, but it's not going through on the other. You have symbol changes. Sometimes a symbol change that doesn't get updated across other brokers means all the orders that would have been there to make the market are, are gone because their system didn't pick up the symbol change. So you can get that really big move. So some of these opportunity, but they can carry a lot of risk. And then down here, for me, I would say is like, you know, your Bank of America and, you know, large caps and, you know, these stocks that just are so range bound, they're so dominated by the algorithms, they don't even move. And then there's kind of this sweet spot in the middle, you know, which requires a certain degree of volume, a certain degree of liquidity. And yes, we can have some big winners sometimes on these lighter volume parabolic stocks over here, but then there's just a point where the risk becomes too high. And yes, we can have some big moves on sometimes stocks that have slightly higher floats, like we did this week with C4 and um, ST. TK or whatever that one was. Um, yeah, that was STTK. But my sweet spot generally is right in this area. And so what does that mean? I'm focusing generally between two and 20. These ones today were all pretty expensive. I'm focusing generally on, you know, stocks that have, um, it doesn't need the dollar sign here, stocks that have news. None of these had news today, which made me even more skeptical. I like to focus on stocks that have relative volume of five times. These ones, may have higher relative volume because their actual volume is just so light. Um, but but their total volume is still um, just doesn't really work. Uh, so I like to see stocks, obviously, that are up at least 10%. I like to see floats of, you know, under 20 million shares. So this is kind of the sweet spot. Some of these were close to fitting in. Uh, some of these SPACs were close to fitting into it today, but um, were either too expensive or didn't have you know good volume and, and when weren't clean. So the trades that I took today, I, I did take a trade on ATAK, uh, ATAK, but uh, you know, and it's fine. I, I made 2300 bucks on it. Um, there's my PL. So I just did this bounce trade down here and I kind of got in a little late. It, so you know, I was sitting here um, and it curls up right here to 17. And I watched it right there and I was like, hmm, you know, I was streaming and I said, I don't know, you know, this, this is curling. That's a nice pop of volume there in that candle. You know, it's definitely off the low, but you know, I already had two red days in a row here. Uh, I'm really not looking to take a third, have a third red day in a row. Although at that moment I was already red on STTK by 500 bucks. So I was like, uh, I don't know you guys. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm really feeling it. I don't usually like trading below VWAP. So it comes back up here to a high of $21, pulls back. And I ended up taking uh, this trade right here, which is probably even riskier because it was right under VWAP, but it did have more volume at this time. So I took that trade and then I bought this dip right here on this bottoming tail candle. And my best exit was probably like $23.50 or something. Actually, I sold, um, um, actually I sold 228 shares at $24.25. That was, that, was, um, that was a pretty good exit. The high was 24.50. Anyways, but I didn't take big size. And so, you know, even though it went up a couple dollars a share, I only made $2,321 on it. Uh, it sells off and, and then that was my only trade on it. it. It ended up selling off. So there was a little bounce on that. If this had continued, I did have the level two up for SMAP. I was like, okay, maybe this one could also bounce off the low, right? I had the level two up for clay. I thought, you know, maybe if one starts to bounce, these others might bounce too. Um, looks like clay is super light volume. BRLI, this one tried to bounce, um, but you know, the, it's just so thinly traded, it just wasn't easy. And then STTK, my trade on that was a little bit earlier. Um, I bought this, it pops up here and I bought this dip right here at $7.30 which was a great, great entry. It goes up to 770. Shoot, I should be up a lot on it. Well, instead of selling when I was up 30 cents a share, I added 
I added more at 750 and I actually added more at 765 and I even added another thousand shares at 770 for the break of 775 and I was looking for that move up to eight. Why was I being so aggressive on this? Well, this one was breaking yesterday's um, high of 750. So I liked the daily setup on it, as you can see right here. Um, I thought if we broke through that level, we might see continuation and maybe a little bit of a short squeeze up to eight, maybe 820, 850. My target was eight. And then unfortunately, you can see right here, the bottom kind of fell out. And in one candle, it was back at 738. And now I was down 20 cents a share or whatever it was, uh, you know, 12 cents a share from my average. So I took the loss on it. It did pop back up pre-market, but I didn't trade that. I was like, no, you know what? I'm just not feeling it here. I just don't, I don't want to push my luck. Um, I'd rather not have a third consecutive green day. So what I've effectively done here is bounced off of my own ascending support line right there. So those are my two red days. So um, I am feeling okay about that, but I still have a little ways to go to reclaim my, my highs. Um, and th this is my all time high ever. I mean, I could zoom this out and you would see that this is, but this is just showing in the last 90 days. So from zero 90 days ago, just 90 day um, equity curve. Uh, you could do 60 day and it just will show you just their 60 day profit or 30 day, whatever. So, you know, yeah, definitely a bummer that I had uh, a little red streak in November, a red day at the beginning of December, and then two red days here and with this one being bigger, um, almost 10,000, whatever. So I, I'm a little, you know, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of like, all right, like I said before, Right now, I've got to re reclaim and recoup about half of that loss, start to get confident, and then I can get a little bit more aggressive. And I hope that I can do all of that within like three or four days. You know what I mean? Like if tomorrow, if on Monday I have a four or $5,000 green day, then just like that, I've made back half my loss um, with that combined with today. So by Tuesday, I could be you know, back in the saddle and ready to be aggressive, but it's going to 100% depend on the market. So if the market is strong and we see some good opportunities, then I can step up to the plate and that's fine. I have to be a little conservative still for a couple more days. Um, you know, I don't want to have another red day if I can help it until I've, you know, I, I like to kind of have this recovery like I had right here, sell off and then recovery, sell off and then recovery. What I don't like doing is having a recovery and then a dip lower and then a recovery and a dip lower, right? So to manage that, I can't get overconfident too fast right here. I've got to keep either keeping losses very tight or, you know, at, at making progress. Making progress would be better, but at least keeping losses really tight and not having another big red day is important. So that's where I'm uh, at here. This is going to be a red week um, despite uh, green on Monday and Tuesday and Friday, three green days. And those green days are, let's see, 3,400 plus two grand is... Uh, 5,400, so like 6,000 in the green days, but then 9,000, uh, almost, let's see, 10, 11,000. So yeah, so down like five grand on the week or so, maybe a little bit more than that. Yeah, it's a bummer. I wouldn't, I'd rather it be the other way that I'm up 5, 10, 15,000 on the week, but these losses are going to happen. So just catching them, getting them out of the way and um, then looking for this next, you know, 10, $15,000 green day. And that'll be, um, that'll certainly be nice. All right. So that is, um, that is it for me. I will be back at it first thing Monday morning. And hopefully we have um, some good stocks on the scan. We didn't have a lot of news today here on Friday. I don't know if Monday will be a lot better, but uh, maybe Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll get a nice little stretch. All right. So that's it for me. Thank you guys for tuning in. And I'll see you back at it. First thing on Monday morning, reminder as always, trading is risky. My results aren't typical. Manage your risk, take it slow. And as always, practice in a simulator before you put real money on the line. If you want to check out an episode uh, that I recently uploaded, I'll put it right here. YouTube thinks you're going to love it. All right, I'll see you guys back here on Monday morning.